Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, awesome to be with you again, as Pastor Sam said. I don't know many of you. Many of you don't know us, but have been here in the past in different uh, ways to share, so we're eager to share again today. And uh, as a family, our daughters are in the front row. They're, they would be in kids' church, but they're uh, taking pictures for our uh, profiles and other media needs. <laughs> so it's a team effort this morning, but uh, we're, uh, we're really happy to be here. And uh, we love Loft City uh, as a family. Uh, Pastor Sam mentioned um, at a ministry called Pure Hope, and we love what you guys are about as a community. Um, I didn't know until today it was an acronym. I guess, you know, you build a relationship, you keep learning about each other. I should have known, right? I mean, even our ministry, there's an acronym in the name. In church, we love acronyms, so I should have known that loft meant something other than just a hip urban term. Uh, but we're living our faith together, and that's what we're going to do today. And we're, we're eager to share, Vanessa and I are going to uh, share from the Word, but also kind of a new journey that we're on that I think will resonate with, with many of you. And we're going to tie that through Scripture, uh, and, and we're excited to do that. But, uh, you know, any good minister will tell you that uh, they are pretty much writing the message up until the moment they come up. <laughs> and uh, that was true for us uh, today, as it always is, because we uh, spent some time last night thinking about how and what we wanted to share. Even as the worship started, we were planning on the flow. But then the worship started, and we read from Scripture, and we sang songs that resonate exactly with what we're going to share just now. So it seems like somebody was planning something. Oh, yes, maybe the Spirit of God was, was planning our time today. Uh, and that's, that's what we're expecting of. So really, really grateful to do it. And glad to do it with, uh, with uh, Sam especially. Uh, we, we have had a special bond, almost hard to describe. Maybe, maybe it is just, I'm a lawyer by training, so accountant, lawyer, very dynamic combination, right? <laughs> like a bad joke. A lawyer and accountant walk into an elevator. Um, but we have had uh, a, an incredible time journey together and, and, and what God is doing in this community. So we look forward to that today. And that's another thing we love about this community. You guys, you know, at Pure Hope, the ministry that I've been with, uh, we really focus on equipping parents to combat and understand and follow Jesus well in this digital exploitative age that we live in, how we can lead our families. Uh, anybody a parent that needs help <laughs> in the digital age? So that's what we're about. But our vision statement is a world free of sexual exploitation and brokenness. That's what we pursue. That's the world that God has promised. And uh, that's one thing I love about coming into Lost City. This is like a little microcosm of the world, like we were talking about. And so that's inspiring. And I think as we share our story and, and get into what we want to share today, uh, that's going to resonate as well. So uh, let me jump right into it. Like I said, we're going to start with a little bit of scripture and some principles that the Spirit's really put on our heart that is being... Uh, manifest in our lives as we walk through this new season that we have uh, been put uh, into and thrust into, as, as I'm going to mention here in a second. But, you know, it's interesting. I'm going to read from Exodus. And for those of you who are familiar with the scriptural narrative, you know that it's the second book of the Bible. And it is kind of the archetypal journey out of bondage to freedom. And that's the heart, the word that is on our heart today, freedom. We sang about it. We read about Moses, who led that journey to freedom, and that's what we're going to talk about. And it's interesting to me that it's the second book of the Bible, and there's 66 books in the Bible. The first one is about how everything got created. The second one is already talking about a journey from slavery into freedom. So it's a good indicator to us that much of life, much of our experience, is a journey from bondage to freedom, from pain to wholeness, from death and captivity to life and to abundance. And that's an encouraging word, but the, uh, uh, the, the, the journey is uh, chock full of difficulties and obstacles. And uh, that's what we're going to read about. So the first one is interesting. We have three principles, basically, that as we share a little bit about what we're doing now and leading a social enterprise um, to help women come out of sexual exploitation in Delhi and to draw people and create a market here in the U.S. for a product that will be sustainable that I'll let Vanessa talk about is it is all about journeying. And even as we set about, many of us in this room are setting about, whether through ministry and advancing the gospel or perhaps other ventures and enterprises where our goal is to help and assist and come alongside and advocate for someone to bring them to a place of freedom, we start to realize really quickly that, oh, wow, we're in the journey with them. We are actually in a journey of being freed and liberated ourselves. And that's what we see in Exodus. 
We see in Exodus a story of a nation being brought out of bondage, but it starts with one person, a person, by the way, who had fled Moses from violence, from possible danger, into the wilderness. And for those of you who are familiar with the story, in chapter 4, starting in chapter 3, actually, he comes across this miraculous burning bush, and God speaks to him through it. And he says, hey, I've chosen you to go back and do this amazing, world-changing thing. Now, most of us will be like, whoo, finally, yes, let me get my device ready. I'm going to Instagram this thing to death. Look, look. But what does Moses do? You know the story? He says, can you choose someone else, please? I, I, I don't have what it takes. In fact, he says, after God says, I'm choosing you and I'm sending you and I'm filling you and I'm going to do this amazing thing to bring liberation, Moses says, but God, behold, they won't believe me or listen to my voice and they'll say, the Lord didn't appear to you. And the Lord starts talking to him and says, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to choose you. And Moses finally loses every other option except to say, my Lord, I can't talk. I'm not eloquent neither in the past nor right now can I speak to your people. Choose, please, someone else. And we can imagine here tears, maybe even a stamping of the sandals that he's just taken off on the ground, saying, take someone else. But God says, I've chosen you, and by the way, I'm going to bring help. Your brother Aaron will speak with you. And right there is a principle that we've kind of learned as we've been thrust, and as I have followed my wife's courageous lead into this new season, that there is a first step in journeying to freedom, including leading others to freedom. And that is overcoming the resistance that is rooted in our own lives, our own fears, our own disbeliefs, our own lack of faith. And that is something that we've journeyed through, and I'll let Vanessa share a little bit about that. So I want to start off by talking about um, when I was 18 years old. And I went to visit Noel in college, and one of his friends said to me, I have a word for you. And that word was, you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. At that time, I had no idea where that verse came from. I had no idea where that, what that verse meant or would come to mean in my life, but that's, that's all I had to take with me. Um, and I came to realize that that was from the book of Isaiah, and I came to realize that two years later, my junior year of college, when I was really seeking the Lord about what his purpose was for my life. And I was a member of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and I was in large group one night. Yeah, another IV person back there. <laughs> I was in large group one night, and we were going through scripture, and I came across Isaiah 58. And I was reminded of the prophecy two years prior, you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. However, I did not know the context of that scripture until that evening, my junior year. So Isaiah 58, starting in verse five, is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fast I have chosen? to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear, then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and will strengthen your frame. 
You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And so I read that my junior year, and I read in the context of what God is talking about here in Isaiah 58. And for the first time, I had some kind of vision for what I was supposed to do with my life. Senior year, I come across the organization International Justice Mission, which at that time was in its infancy. And I read Gary Haugen's book, The Good News About Injustice. And to my surprise, I found out that slavery still existed in the world. Now, I was a history major in under undergrad, and I took an entire semester class on the transatlantic slave trade. I took an entire semester class on women's suffrage. I took an entire semester class on the civil rights movement in the US. And every single one of those classes, I always found myself asking, what if I had lived then? What would I have done? Would I have joined the movements in the midst of knowing that it was dangerous, that it was potentially putting my comfort, my life at risk? Or would I have chosen comfort, courage or comfort? What would I have done? And the truth was that I didn't have an answer. Right? I didn't know the answer, but I hoped that I would have chosen courage. So when I came to realize that slavery still existed in the world, I realized that this was my time to choose courage. Right? This is my time to prove to myself and to God that I was going to choose his way. I was going to live by Isaiah 58. This was my verse. This was my life song. And now is my time to walk in this, in this mission. So, fast forward to 2003, Noel is in law school, I'm getting my master's in public policy, and I have the opportunity to work for the State Department at the embassy in Guatemala. And one of those evenings, we took a midnight tour of the worst zone of Guatemala City, where trafficking of minors is horrific. And we weren't quite prepared, I think, mentally or emotionally or spiritually for what we were about to encounter that evening. But what we saw was on the street level, pimps, and up in the windows was little girls. And I don't know their ages, but they looked to be about my daughter's ages, my daughter's ages now. I got physically ill, physically sick to my stomach. Um, and there were manifestations of that sickness to my stomach. And that was the first time in my life that I had experienced pure, unadulterated evil right before my very eyes. I had lived a very privileged and very sheltered um, and very blessed upbringing. And never before had I experienced such evil before my very eyes. And I literally could not stomach it. You know, growing up super privileged, I, I always kind of wondered, okay, I know that we're supposed to call out Maranatha, Lord Jesus. I know we're supposed to call out, come Lord Jesus, come and redeem your creation. But man, I have a pretty good life. And I kind of want to experience having kids. And I kind of want to experience, you know, having a family and having a career and doing all of these things. I, you know, if you, if you wait a little while, Jesus, I understand, right? Because I have a life that I want to live. That night when I experienced evil head on, I, I, for the first time, understood Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, because your creation is destroyed. We, ha we are raping and pillaging your earth. We are rape raping and pillaging children. They're being bought and sold like chattel. We need you to return and redeem your creation. But I also knew that he said, until I do that, you are called. So we found ourselves in this interesting situation because neither Noel nor I felt called to do what we thought we were being called to do, which was break down brothel doors and literally rescue, uh, rescue trafficking victims out of their bondage we realized that that's not what we were called to do. And we also realized that our, the culture in which we live is so responsible for the supply and demand 
of victims of human trafficking. It's a cultural issue that we all contribute to. And so I decided that, you know, I'm a super analytical person. Instead, I'm going to pursue a PhD and I'm gonna bring my gifts and talents and abilities to bear by doing research on this issue that informs policy and practice um, at both the governmental and non-governmental levels. And Noel went into ministry and pursued um, the ministry of Pure Hope, where they really get into the nitty gritty of tackling the cultural issues that are driving sexual exploitation. So now I'm a professor at TCU, and I've made my career for the past 10 years as a teacher scholar activist on this issue of human trafficking. And as part of my teaching, I have led study abroad to India to, for a class called Transnational Human Trafficking. And this journey started in 2014, and it was in the class that I took in 2017 um, that I was encountered and challenged by this woman in the red light district in Delhi. We were sitting on the floor of the medical clinic, and she said to me, why should I tell you anything about my story? You know, people come here and exploit us multiple times a day for our bodies, but you're coming here to exploit us for our story. I don't owe you anything. Why should I tell you anything? And I said, yep, you're absolutely right. You don't have to tell me anything, and you don't owe me anything. I said, but if there's one thing that you need, what is it? And she said, defiantly, I need dignified employment to get out of this dirty business. And I said, I'd like to help you do that. Now, when I said that at the time, my thought was, surely there is some kind of social enterprise that exists in Delhi working with women wanting to come out of prostitution. I just have to find it and connect this woman with it. And then I've done my job, I've made good on my promise, and I'm out and I can continue being a teacher scholar activist, right? Um, Six months later, after exhausting many, many, many connections that I've made in India in this anti-trafficking space over the course of the last five years, I come up dry. There's nothing in India. Sure, there's plenty of things in Kolkata. There's some social enterprises in Mumbai. There's various ones at various, uh, across other areas of India, but for a variety of reasons, there was nothing in Delhi for these women, despite the fact that there's an estimated 4,000 to 6,000 women in prostitution in Delhi, or in the red light district of Delhi, GB Road. So, okay, I made this promise to this woman and I can't fulfill it in the way that I had thought I was gonna fulfill it. Uh, now, what do I do? Do I just leave her high and dry um, because I can't do what I thought I was gonna do? What do I do? Um, I am not a business person, <laughs> okay? In fact, I have grown up, uh, not not grown up, but college and into my PhD program, I, I've, I've come to actually despise capitalism <laughs> in certain ways, and as, particularly when I put it up against the values of scripture, um, you know, I've just said, whoa, 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 the way, it, the way that we are doing business today is not... I don't believe the way that God would have us doing business. Um, and that's not to say that all business is bad, right? But it is to say that as, as the church, we ought to be thinking more critically about how we should be using business as a force for good that aligns with scriptural principles. Um, so that's my mindset about business. And I've always been like, I'm not touching the private sector. That is not my thing. That's not my interest. I don't want to go there. And I don't really want to learn that much about it, frankly. Um, and now I find myself in a place of God saying, you need to start a business. And I'm go doing the Moses thing. Like, I don't know anything about business. I don't even like business. I don't want to use business to, you know, to, there's got to be another way. There's got to be another way. Um, and I find myself in this position of discomfort um, and, and, and complaint completely lacking confidence in my ability to do, to do this. 
in that six month time period when I realized that there was nothing for this woman in Delhi and I'm questioning, you know, God's calling on me to do something about it, I receive a email from a random person. And most of the time when I receive emails from random people, I ignore them. I'm not going to lie. Um, I, don't, I don't usually respond. However, because I get a lot, a lot of, you know, can I be researched? Can you support me in coming to the U.S. and study under you, et cetera, et cetera? And I usually just, eh, no. But there was something about this email that intrigued me. And this woman said, hi, um, I just moved to the DFW area. I'm passionate about women's empowerment and anti-trafficking work. And I'm wondering if you need a research assistant, a volunteer research assistant. And I'm always looking for quality people. And she attached her CV. I opened it up. She's from Kolkata originally. She has her MBA from one of the top universities in India. And she has a master's degree in international development from the London School of Economics. And I'm like, jackpot, you know? <laughs> and I literally felt like she was manna from heaven. And that is the next sort of principle on this journey of freedom that we want to talk about is God's provision. And when you don't feel equipped to go, he will give you what you need along the way. And Ushri was the first example of that for us. He gave us exactly who we needed when we needed her along the way. Yeah, and there's more examples of that to come as we've launched this social enterprise. But that is the journey. It's the second principle. That after we take that first step and we respond to God and say, yes, this place I am in, this place I've been stuck in, this habit, this lifestyle, this behavior, this situation, this relationship, this community, this place that has kept me in bondage, I see a vision of freedom, but I, I don't believe in myself enough to get there. Once God has worked into us, brought to us a person, brought to us an advocate, moved by his spirit us into that first step. And then we find ourselves where? In the promised land right away? No, in the desert <laughs> without any food or water. <laughs> and yet, that's the journey to freedom. So many of us in the room today might feel that way. Maybe we have taken some first steps. Who knows what, how many different backgrounds, how many different scenarios we're walking through right now. Many of us are stuck and we know we need the freedom that Jesus is offering us today. Many of us might have taken those first steps and right now we're saying, this is hard. This is hard, and I either want someone to teleport me to the promised land, or I'm just going to go back, because it was easier. At least I knew what I was about back here. But that is where the work is done. That's where the freedom is worked into us. And that's what we see as a second principle. Once the people had come out of bondage, once Moses and Aaron, Miriam, have led them into this place where they're being refined, God provides. He provides this thing called manna that drops down every day from heaven. And there are a couple things in our journey of launching this social enterprise called Severa, which we'll get to, is this. First of all, God provides. We have to believe that. Wherever we are right now, wherever we are today, God is providing. He is providing. And the provision might even be there. So sometimes our prayer has to be, God, open the eyes of my heart so that I can see your provision. The second thing is that it comes in unexpected ways even when we are looking for it. Because Moses told the people, hey guys, God's going to do this thing. It's going to be amazing. There's no food anywhere around. He's going to rain bread from heaven and you're going to go pick it up. Every single day he's going to provide food. And people are like, okay, I'll believe it when I see it. And they walk out and there's this bread on the ground. Now it's not like any bread they had ever seen. They're in a new journey, a whole new lifestyle. And this whole new provision has been provided. So they look at it and they said, and scripture literally says, the people said, eh? Another way to think about it, what the... What is it? That's literally what manna means. It means, what is it? I don't know, but it's pretty good and sweet, and I need something because I'm in the desert. But still, what is this? It comes in unexpected ways. That's how God works, because he's shaping us in this journey of freedom. He's shaping us to see differently. He's shaping us to hear differently. He's shaping us to have different desires, to desire different foods. They kept saying in the old King James Version, let's go back to Egypt where the flesh pots were. <laughs> I don't know what a flesh pot is, but I guess in the ancient world it was a pretty good thing. But now they got this bread, and it tastes like honey. That's a real good thing, but even their appetites, their desires, took a little while. So in this journey to freedom, we're constantly being changed, but the provision is happening. And here's the third thing about it. It happens every single day. 
You couldn't keep manna overnight or it got rotten. We can't keep the things and hold on to the things God gives us today until tomorrow. He's going to give us new mercies tomorrow, new grace tomorrow, new provision tomorrow, new relationship tomorrow, new revelation tomorrow. Today is for today. And that's an encouraging thought for us because a lot of us are like, hey, I just want this to be over. But a journey usually takes a long time. But here's the thing about it. The word journey in English comes from the French jour, meaning day. A journey is one day at a time. And that's why God provides one day at a time. And that's something we've seen through relationships with like Ushri. And as we've launched the enterprise, everything from logo designers to label makers, God's provided. Right. So that's the next principle is, is provision um, along, along the way and him giving us exactly what we need. And so Ushri was just the first example of that. When I told her, she originally started working with me on my research. And about a month in, I said, I, I got to tell you about this other problem that I have. And I told her, and she said, like it was no big deal, well, Vanessa, we'll start something. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, we'll just start something. No big deal. You know, and she said, no, 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 I've, I've started two businesses in India. I totally know how to do this thing. Like, we're just going to do it. We'll, do, we'll just do it. And so she was kind of the first push of encouragement to say, we can do this. Um, that was January of 2018. Noel comes to me February of 2018, and he said, you know, for my solo pilgrimage this year, because, you know, he's an introvert and he needs solo pilgrimaging. Um, <laughs> for my solo pilgrimage this year, I think I'm going to do India, because, you know, you have been there so many times. You've, it's, been, it's become such a big part of your life. I've never been, and I think that that's where I want to go. And I said, that's fine, but if you go, you know I'm going to put you to work. And he was like... You, you're not allowed. This is my pilgrimage. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but you're not allowed to go on a pilgrimage to India when I have work for you to do there. <laughs> and so um, long story short, we decided that his pilgrimage was going to turn into a we pilgrimage and we were going to go together to basically get this thing off the ground. It was a knockdown drag out. I mean, I was like, what happened to my solo pilgrimaging? I thought this was <laughs> thing. It was. There was fighting that went, that went along with this story. Um, but so, because then he didn't get his solo pilgrimage at all for 2018, <laughs> so I guess I owe you one, but, or two. Um, but, fast forward then to, well, in the midst of this, we decide that, you know, okay, we're going to start something. We start talking to some of the women in, on, on GB Road that I had been having communication with, because I had... Speaking of him providing for you even without you knowing that he's providing for you, the fact that I had been going to India for so many years and had, I had developed very, very deep relationships with some very key organizations there. Now, at the time, I thought that those relationships were all about my teaching and research, um, nothing beyond that. And now, but now it turned into something completely other than that. Um, and so, so they connected us with some of these women and we had a Skype call with them. And we said, look, we're gonna come there and we're gonna start a social enterprise for you. Um, but this is yours. We're doing this for you guys to be able to have a way to come out of the brothels. And we wanna give you naming rights over it because we wanna make sure that you know that this is truly yours. And so they came up with the name Severa which is a Hindi word for morning or dawn or new beginning. And that was very meaningful for them because this is their new life. This is their opportunity for a new life. We went there in June and we had to, we had a lot that we needed to get done, including finding a uh, production facility. And um, the place that we ended up renting from, the landlord was a woman who is in her early 30s and very educated, young, and hip. And she, we were kind of skeptical at first. We don't really want to tell them what we're going to be doing in this space. Like, let's keep it on the DL. Um, but she kept pressing in and asking questions. So what are you guys doing? So why are you here? So, and so finally I, I thought, I, I, think, I think I can trust her with this message. And so I told her the story. And she said, oh my goodness, I am astounded 
by what you're doing. You know, here I am, an Indian myself, with the means to help people, and I'm doing nothing. And here you are, coming from the U.S., here to do something for people that we're not even caring about. She said, you know, I actually have my undergraduate degree in psychology, and I've done some trauma-informed counseling in the past. If you need, like, any volunteer counselors, I would be really interested in, in doing that. I was like, okay, yes. Um, then when we got back to the States, over the course of several months, she kept pinging me on WhatsApp, just thinking about you, hope everything is going well, blah, blah, blah. And then we got to a point where we needed to hire a production manager. And uh, I texted her the job description and said, you know, this person needs to be well-trained in, you know, counseling and trauma-informed care because we need someone who's going to create a trauma-informed environment for these women. It's not all about getting the job done. It's about having a safe place for them to be. And she texted me back and said, did you write this for me? And she had a great job. She had a great job at, at the, in the airline industry doing customer service. She was rising in the ranks of the, in the, uh, the corporate ladder. Um, and here she is interested in taking a risk on this, like, we didn't even know what it was going to be yet, right? Um, and so I said, well, are you interested? And she said, well, yes. And I said, okay, uh, well, send us your resume and we'll do an interview, et cetera, et cetera. And so we did, and she ended up being our first production manager and is still our production manager. Another provision that we absolutely, under no circumstances, could have predicted that this person who we rented space from would end up being our production manager. Um, now, you're probably wondering, what kind of business is this? What are you doing? <laughs> um, and so we decided that we would be an essential oil business. And um, the reason for that is there's a variety of reasons. One is that it's deep, essential oils are deeply rooted in Indian culture and tradition, um, Ayurvedic healing cultures. Um, and the second is that um, we thought, how amazing would it be to have a product that the women are healing as they're working, right? Because they're working on something that has healing properties in its very DNA. That would be kind of amazing. So it's not like jewelry, it's not like sewing at a sewing machine, it's like working with oils that by virtue of walking into your workplace, you are breathing in this healing aroma. Um, and then third, it's a hugely booming industry in the United States and we think that we could be successful with it, which only means more jobs for more women. Um, and so we decided to be an essential oil business. Um, we had the provision of an amazing supplier in India. And that trip back in June, we met with a variety of different suppliers and we found one who was super honest, um, super willing to spend time with us, to educate us on everything that we needed to know about essential oils, just another provision um, along the way. And there's a variety of ways that they have been a blessing to us. And then most recently, um, we had been having real problems with our labels. And the business model is, uh, for, for the time being, our, our women are labeling and packaging the essential oils That'll then, that are then exported to the United States. Um, but our, the quality of our labels was very, very poor, and we were struggling to find a really good label supplier um, in India. And so my dad used to be in the label industry before he retired, and he said to us, you know, let me contact my old colleague and see if he knows of any label companies in India that are reputable, you know, that produce high quality labels. So he sends an email to his old colleague, and the next thing we know, his colleague writes back and says, we are so blessed and humbled by what your daughter and son-in-law are doing that we would like to provide all of your labels free, all of their labels free of charge. Free of charge. <laughs> and I said, yeah, they know that we're like a for-profit business, right? Like we're not an NGO. Like they know that they're, you know, and he, he, so he said, well, make sure that they know. Tell them when you write them back. And so I did. And he said, no, 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 we know. 
he said, we, we think what you're doing is so powerful and so profound that this will be part of our own corporate social responsibility initiative. Now, this is the second largest label company in the world that makes labels for very high-end brands, of which we are not yet. Um, and, and so to, for them to be willing to support us in this way is absolutely huge and just another provision. And each step along the way, as we've been saying, there have been a variety of times that I've said, I can't do this, Lord. I can't do this. I, I can't do this. And boom, something else happens. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I can't do this. Why are we doing this? Why are you calling us to do this? How are we doing this? Boom, something else happens. And he continues to provide that manna, continues to provide that manna, which is not only provision for, for the women, but it's also confirmation for us that God is blessing this journey. Confirmation for us in the enterprise itself, which is a benefit corporation called Severa, marketing essential oils here while bringing freedom and dignified employment to women in Delhi, but also in our relationship. And that's something that all of us, I think, can connect with. Whatever academically, professionally, whatever journey we're going through, it's shaping us. And it's gonna shape the relationships around us, our marriages, our relationships with our children, our relationships with our friends and peer group, uh, fiance, whatever life stage we're in, we're being shaped. And those provisions have shaped our marriage. And it leads us to the last principle uh, before we close, which in this journey to freedom, we have initial resistance, fear, disbelief, uh, about the call itself. And then we see once we get into the desert and it's hard, God provides in unexpected ways. But there's another thing and another obstacle and another sobering reality about the journey to freedom, which is even before you get into the promised land, God stops and says, oh, by the way, in that promised land, I've given it to you, it's all yours, but there's giants in there. <laughs> even as we get to the end of the journey, there's still that next cliff, that next step of faith to take, which says God will fight the battle for even as he's been provided, even as he's taken us through the wilderness, we need to take the last step. And that, that is the true, I think, battle with fear. And we've experienced that in different ways in our lives. We experienced it <laughs> on that first trip to Delhi. It's my first time there. I got there a day before. I was excited. I'm like soaking up the culture. I'm just loving it. She gets there the next day. We wake up in the morning in the hotel, and she's crying her eyes out, bawling. And I'm like, we're finally together here. This is amazing. She's What's going on? I don't want to... I, I was overwhelmed with anxiety. And, and feeling most of us. completely ill-equipped to be doing what we were about to set out to do. And it was, it was, it was overwhelming fear um, that had me just, I, I can't do, we can't do this. Uh, what are we doing? What are we doing? You know, because, you know, it's not about starting a business and the business fails. Fine. If that happened, I'll be an entrepreneur. I'll start a business. It fails, fine. I'll start another one, whatever. But this is about people's lives, right? Like, not that other businesses aren't about people's lives. They are. You have employees that you need to care for. But these women are depending on us. We cannot let them down. And that gave me crippling anxiety mm. while we were there. And I said, it's fine. We got this. We're going to go do it. You know, God's on our side. He's made a way. And I go down for a walk that morning, and I go to a bookseller who's become a good friend every time I go now. Older gentleman who handed me a book. He said, I have this book for you. Read this one. This is my pick. And I look at it, and he had just given to a white male Westerner a book on how the British Empire had raped and pillaged India for <laughs> centuries. And it was about that thick. And that was a bit sobering. And I said, yes, Lord, this is not my role. This is your role to come and bring freedom. But that is the last step, that step of taking a step in the face of fear. And here's what Scripture tells us as we close. I used to think the response to fear was courage. I think we all think that. Just be courageous. Scripture actually says in 1 John 4 that love drives out fear. And that has been transformative. Because what I've learned in the journey, we've seen this play out in this journey over the last two years, is that fear is about self-protection. When I'm afraid, what I'm really feeling is a temptation to protect myself. I'm being attacked. It could be by a wild beast, but it could be by this social group. It could be fear of financial ruin, and I'm going to self-protect when I'm afraid, and I won't take the step, because when I'm afraid, I'm going to self-protect. Love, Jesus tells us, is self-giving. Greater love has no one than this. You lay down your life. So the response to my temptation to self-protect, to say this is too hard, to say, I don't think I'm good enough. I don't think I can get to the place of freedom. I don't think I can get out of this pattern I've been in my whole life. The response is to self-give. 
to confess, to speak into, to be generous, to open up. That's the response to fear. And that is the response that we've seen move the Holy Spirit. Right, and one of the challenges that we recently had is, you know, we think this this one woman, who, by the way, is I reconnected with her this past March, and she's now working for us and doing phenomenally well. Um, but we think, great, we we're providing jobs for these women, and so it's easy. Now they'll come out of the brothel, they'll have a new life, and they're just going to move right along. And we found that that's, you know we've we've known that it, it's not that easy because we both of us have been working in this area for a while but you know just like the israelites where it's like wait we're bringing you to the promised land like you should be thankful you should be excited to enter that arena um you don't why would you want to go back right um it's the same thing for the our employees um many of them are having challenges with this new life and going back going back into the brothels. Um, and if we were a normal business, we would say, okay, fine, you're done, right? But we're not, and God's not done. And this self-giving love and this, this, this God that we serve who, who asks you to come back again and again and again and again and never, ever, ever, ever gives up on you. And eventually you're gonna see that he is so good that why would you want anything else, right? And so the way that we're approaching employment with Severa is you can go back to the brothels as many times as you want. You're still gonna have a job here. You're still gonna have a place here. You're still gonna have safety here. You're still gonna be loved here. You're still gonna be received here. And eventually they may realize that it's not worth it anymore, right? That, that this is a gift that they don't need to be taking for granted. Um, but that's the same thing with our own sin. Um, you know, it's like we go back to these old habits all the time, old habits. And when God is saying, man, I have a better place for you. I have such a better place for you. And yet instead of choosing that better place, we fall back into these old habits. And so we are no different from the women that we're employing um, in our own sin and in our own brokenness. And that's one of the things that we want to establish with Severa is this notion of human connection mm -hmm. that regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your upbringing, regardless of your experiences, we are all human and God has created each and every one of us uniquely in his image. Mm -hmm. And as humans, we can connect one another, connect with one another on a level um, that is intimate mm -hmm. and beautiful just by seeing somebody else's humanity. Mm -hmm. So it's been wonderful to share this with you this morning and commune. And here's, here's our two asks from you as uh, we've been given the opportunity to, to make an ask. The first one is to pray for us as we continue on this journey of being novice, early stage startup social entrepreneurs. Yet doing it courageously, we're leaving for Delhi next week. Pray for us and our family. Secondly, we'll launch our e-commerce site in about two months, so severa.com. Premium USDA certified organic essential oils, ready for purchase from all of you. So help us go to the next level. But here's our encouragement to you. God is with you. He's with all of us, and he's taking us from a place. Our whole lives is being taken from one place to another. Second book of the Bible, our whole lives is a continual journey. And so our encouragement and exhortation would be to you today to pray into where is that place that I'm being brought out of? Lord, give me vision for where you're taking me to. But where is that place that I'm afraid? And how can we recognize our fear and love into it? Love God fully into our fear by saying, I trust you. I trust you will provide if I obey, and I trust you will fight my battles for me. That's the journey that we're all on. So with that, thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you.